Genesis, Jesus is the ram at Abraham's altar. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the city of our refuge. In Joshua, he's the scarlet thread out Rahab's window. In Judges, he is our judge. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is our trusted prophet. And in Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything that is broken. In Esther, he is the Mordecai sitting faithful at the gate. In Job, he's our redeemer that ever liveth. In Psalms, he is my shepherd and I shall not want. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. And in the Song of Solomon, he's the beautiful bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the suffering servant. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, 
it is Jesus that is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wonderful four-faced man. And in Daniel, he is the fourth man in the midst of the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is my love that is forever faithful. In Joel, he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, our Savior. And in Jonah, he is the great foreign missionary that takes the word of God into all the world. In Micah, he is the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he is the avenger. In Habakkuk, he's the watchman that is ever praying for revival. In Zephaniah, he is the Lord, mighty to save. In Haggai, he is the restorer of our lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is our fountain. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. In Matthew, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. In Mark, he is the miracle worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he is the door by which every one of us must enter. In Acts, he is the shining light that appears to Saul on the road to Damascus. In Romans, he's our justifier. In 1 Corinthians, our resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, our sin bearer. In Galatians, he redeems us from the law. In Ephesians, he is our unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he supplies our every need. And in Colossians, he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he is our soon coming king. And in 1 and 2 Timothy, he is the mediator between God and man. In Titus, he is our blessed hope. In Philemon, he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And in Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, it is the Lord that heals the sick. In First and Second Peter, he is the chief shepherd. In First, Second, and Third John, it is Jesus who has the tenderness of love. In Jude, he is the Lord coming with 10,000 saints. And in Revelation, lift up your eyes, church, for your redemption draweth nigh. He is our King of kings and Lord of lords.
Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We want to thank you for the blessings of this life. Thank you for the preparation for the next life. Thank you for everything that you know in our lives. And I pray now for this time that uh, you will bless the pastor, bless us with your words through him, and allow him to speak freely and deliver your message so that you might touch our hearts and our minds and that we might respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you join me in the book of Judges this morning, the book of Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. As Wayne went over the books of the Bible, talking about Judges is where God judges us. But I'd like to talk this morning about waiting. Uh, the title of the message is Waiting, okay? I don't know if you've ever had to wait before. Wait on a ride. Uh, wait on food. Uh, maybe at a restaurant. Uh, maybe uh, refills. I was at a restaurant just the other night and um, I noticed a couple of folks sitting at one table and they kept waiting on the waiter to come by and refill their glasses. And finally, one of them just got up and went and got the pitcher and filled it themselves, you know. Got tired of waiting. I don't know if you ever get tired of waiting. Uh, maybe waiting on a refund from your taxes, waiting on the preacher to quit preaching. But a lot of times we spend a lot of time waiting, don't we? A lot of time waiting. I was at the hospital uh, Monday at an aunt uh, having some surgery, having two stents put in. The doctor came out and said things went well and that I could go back in about 10 or 15 minutes and be with her. I waited 10 minutes. I waited 20 minutes. I waited an hour. I waited two hours. I waited four hours. Finally, I thought, something. I know she's honoring. <laughs> but I thought for sure they'd come got me by now. But out of the blue, I finally decided, well, I'll go where the room was where she was before she went. She was already admitted into the hospital. I went up to the sixth floor where she was before we went to the surgery and she was in her room waiting on me. <laughs> I'm waiting and she's waiting. We're both waiting. So I want to talk about waiting this, mo this morning because we understand how frustrating waiting sometimes can be. Here in Judges chapter 6, let's look at a few of the verses. Verse 11 there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was at Ophrah, that pertained to Joash, the Bizarite, and his son Gideon, threshing wheat by the th uh, wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his, these miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? As we look at these few verses for a moment, and we'll glaze over a few of the other verses here in this chapter, we find here an angel from God, and some people kind of believe it with Jesus himself, sitting up under an oak tree. Doing what? Waiting. He's just waiting here under the oak tree. Here's Gideon over here. He's, he's threshing these uh, sweet over here by the wine press. He's hiding out because he's afraid they're going to come and steal his goods. Now, if you were to read the first part of the chapter, we find how Israel, no matter what they did, they would come and steal their stuff. I mean, that can be a frustrating thing, trying to accomplish something when somebody else keeps destroying it. I had a younger brother. And I, I can remember trying to play as a child. I'd get up here and I'd start stacking up blocks, you know, building me a little tower. And here would come my little brother, and he'd destroy it. Man, it'd make me so mad. 
I mean, I had so many hours of labor and work. I mean, it was worth a lot of money, that block house I was building. And he would totally destroy it. As soon as you would, I'd start screaming and hollering for mom, all right? I mean, because everything I would do, he would destroy it. That's frustrating. That's frustrating. <coughs> they was trying to build uh, a life for themselves. They were plowing the fields. The crops would start growing. About the time they'd think of fixing to get into a harvest, they would come and steal away their harvest. There was more people than they could control. And they were frustrated. And they was waiting on God to do something about it. They were waiting on God to do something about it. That kind of makes me think there's a lot of people even here today that's waiting on God to do some miraculous thing in their life. Waiting on God. You may be a young person thinking God's going to send that, that handsome prince your way or that young lady your way. Well, you know, you're waiting on God to do that. Or maybe uh, you're waiting on your finances to get a little better and you're just waiting for God to open up the windows of heaven and pour out his blessings upon you and reward you richly. You're waiting on God. Maybe you've got a situation with your, with your teenage son or maybe with your husband or somebody. You're waiting for God to come and anoint them with a ball peen hammer and get them to come to life. You're waiting on God to do something in their lives. You're waiting. But you need to understand why they were in this situation. If you looked at the very first verse, it said, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them unto the hands of the Midian, Seven years. It said they were under these conditions because of sin in their lives. Isn't it amazing? We get sin in our lives, and because of sin in our lives, it separates us from God. It separates us from the power of God. It separates us from the love of God, the fellowship of God, and the blessings of God. It separates us, and all of a sudden, you know what we want to do? We want to blame God. Why did God allow this to happen? Like we haven't done anything. We haven't done anything. You remember the, uh, the days, I don't know if it's even still on TV, the fake wrestling where they jump in the ring and they do all this kind of stuff and want to distract the, ref uh, the referee out there in the ring and, uh, and then he turns back around and they act like they hadn't done anything. That's sort of the way we are. We act like we haven't done anything. But we're reaping what we've sown. The Israelites here, they were reaping what they, were, they had sown in their lives. They had sin in their lives. And here it is, we find this angel just sitting under a tree. You'd think that he'd be doing something about this situation. You'd think he'd be watching guard or, or, or out here with a big stick to fight off the enemy. But he's just sitting there. Just sitting there. You want me to tell you what? God's waiting to do here what God's waiting to do in your life and my life he's waiting too not only are you waiting God's waiting that's frustrating you know that to two people be waiting well I thought you was thinking to do something I thought you was thinking to do it waiting on the other one we kind of get stubborn sometimes there's a show I remember watching a show one time called Everybody Loves Raymond. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. But he'd come in one day and he had his suitcase and he would go halfway up the stairs and he'd set it down for his wife to carry it the rest of the way up and unpack it. Well, she decided she wasn't going to do that. She was going to wait until he carried it up. He was going to wait on her. So guess what? It just stayed there. It just stayed there. And that was part of the show, that, what, that suitcase. And come time for him to go on another trip and all his dirty clothes were still in that. He didn't have one. He, he was good with a paper bag. You know, he didn't have to have a suitcase. He was still going to wait on her to get that and clean those clothes and waiting on him. And she said, I'm going to wait him out. We're playing that waiting game a lot of times with God because I promise you, God, he tells us in scriptures, for salvation, this is what he said. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So guess what God's doing? God's just waiting. God's waiting for you to call. God wants to. God wants to. But he's waiting on you. Waiting on you. But we sitting here waiting on God to save us. and waiting. What? God's waiting for you to call. What about, it? maybe you've already been a, a saved, and, but all of a sudden you've gotten away from God. Sin's got in your life. Guess what he's doing? He's sitting there with 
With soap in one hand, brillo pad in the other hand, and he's waiting for you to say, confess your sins. Because he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. He's sitting there with it ready to go. But he's waiting on you to make the move. That's the way things work. He's waiting for the green light. You know what a green light is? I hope so. Especially if you drive. For a green light to come on, now Mark's a police officer, he knows these things. For a green light to come on for me, you know what's got to happen to the other ones? A red light's got to take place, doesn't it? I mean, it's not an instant thing. When that red light turns red there, you don't hit the gas here. You still wait until it turns green. And then you still, you're obligated to make sure it's clear before you proceed. Okay? Now, there's a reason behind that, doesn't it? There's a reason behind it. What if both of them had green lights? So guess what? For this green light to work, there's got to be a red light. Red light means something's got to stop. Before we can have the green light of Jesus, there's something that's got to stop. Sin. Sin. You've got to have it completely stopped under control. Before God starts blessing. And guess what God's doing? He's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. For you to say, repent, and say, God, I turn it all over to you. I've done evil, I've done wrong, but now I have stopped. Now I have given you the right way and given you control of my life. So what is this angel doing under the tree? He's waiting for a green light. Waiting for a green light. Because he wants to. But guess what? He, it doesn't say he's up frantically doing things. He's just sitting there under a tree. And I can make Gideon and all the rest of them think, you think he'd be doing something. He is. He's waiting. He's waiting. Now, because he's waiting, guess what? There's a lot of blessings waiting also. There's a lot of the anointing of God waiting also. hope I've got you for just a minute here. You've got to understand, there's family members that you know, you've got that need God's hand upon their lives. But God just needs a red light. I mean a green light. You need a red light. To get focused and give God complete control. We need to give it. And as long as we don't, Guess what? We're losing. They went seven years until finally, it said in verse 6, after finally, after all these things had taken place, after seven years, it said in the close of verse 6, he said, and Israel cried unto the Lord. They've been their own power trying to fix it. And now they're saying, I need God. I need God. And verse 7 says, It came to pass that when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all the oppress you, and drove them out from before you. And gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But ye have not obeyed my voice. He said, there's a reason you're here today. I have delivered you before. And I can do it again. I'm just waiting on you to be in a position for me to do that. Because, listen, to have the freedom uh, uh, that comes through uh, repentance, to have the freedom of God blessing us and having the freedom of knowing that God is in control, there's limits to that. There's expectations to that. Would we all agree today that, uh, that there's such things as limits? Freedom, it comes with responsibilities. A driver driving down the road can drive as freely as they want to drive as long as they stay within the limits. You may have a car and go 120 miles an hour, but there's limits that says you can't do that. And if you do that, there's penalties behind that. 
There are stop signs and things that you've got to obey. There's limits out there. You're free to drive, but there's limits to it. Adam and Eve was put in the Garden of Eden. They could had freely to live and enjoy the blessings of the Garden of Eden, but there was a limit there. But when we go beyond the limits, guess what? We forfeit our freedom. We forfeit our blessings. That's what got them in this kind of shape. We may be in a shape today because we have gone beyond our limits. And now we want to blame God. But God wants to get us back in His good graces. God wants to bless us. We need to understand He's done His part. A gift card. I don't know if anyone, a lot of times for Christmas, birthdays, people give gift cards. You know what a gift card is, don't you? It's given to you and that, you know what, in order to get the gift card, some things have to take place. First thing has to take place, somebody has to purchase it. Someone has to buy it. It doesn't come free, somebody paid for it. You say, oh, a free gift card. Well, it's free to you, but it costs somebody that gave it to you. In order for that gift card to do its job, somebody's got to pay for it. The second thing is, somebody also has to receive it. In order for you to use it, you have to take it. In other words, to enjoy the salvation that God provides, you have to take that salvation. You have to receive it. And not only that, you have to spend it. I mean, I've gone through some drawers and maybe some things later on. I thought, I've had this gift card two years. And I forgot about it. I put it in this drawer and forgot about it. I don't know if you've ever done that before. Put it away and you forgot about it. Guess what that card did? It did you no good because it sat there dormant. It sat there, was doing you no good or anybody else any good. It was just there. I promise you today there's blessings from heaven that's here for us, but if we don't, he's already paid for it. We've got to receive it, but all of a sudden receiving, we have to spend it. We have to use it. We've got to use it. If we're in good graces with God and we call upon him, guess what? He's going to be there. When you go into a store, it's got a gift card, and you see something, it's a $50 gift card, and you see something for $50, guess what? You can get anything in that store for $50, can't you? Because somebody's paid for it, you've got it in hand, now you're willing to pay, uh, use it. If we're in good graces with God, like we should, no matter what we need, as long as it's in the limitations of it, God is going to take care of it. You know what he said? Whatsoever you ask. In other words, it's unlimited. Everything in the store. All we got to do is call upon God. But God is doing what? He's waiting for us to come. He's waiting for us. Waiting. Well, he comes to Gideon, we find here, and he's threshing here, and he comes to him and says, Why is this happening to me? Why is all these things happening? And he just says, in verse 14, says, Go in this your might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hands of the Midianites, have not I sent thee? I mean, he said the answer is right here before you. I send you, you've got to go. You've got to do your part. Now, he could chose to do nothing. And guess what? If by doing nothing, those people that were waiting for God's deliverance wouldn't have got it. The power that God wanted to bestow upon him wouldn't have took place. If he did nothing, he had to do something, did he? Well, then he starts throwing in all the excuses. We can throw excuses in today, can't we? We can show all kinds of excuses. He goes in talking about you know, himself. He said, verse 15, he said unto him, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor. He said, I am the least of my father's house. He said, I can't do these things. God's not limited. If God tells you to go, God's going to give you the strength. God dealt with me about walking down that aisle to accept Him as personal Lord and Savior. And guess what? I didn't know how I was going to do that because I didn't know how God could save me. But guess what? That wasn't my problem. That was His. All I had to do was go. All I had to do was go. If God sends you to somebody's house to deal with them, talk with them, pray with them, it doesn't matter if you know how it's going to work out. God's going to do that. You just go. You just go. God's going to do the rest. He's waiting for us to make our move. To step out on faith. And then God kicks in. Because I'm telling you, with God, everything changes. 
The greatest thing in this life is knowing Jesus. Everything works better when you know Jesus. Everything works better when you apply Jesus to it. It doesn't matter if it's a personal life. If it's a personal life, I don't care if you're tall, short, medium size. It doesn't matter. But if you have Jesus to it, you'll be, you have a better life. I don't care what kind of marriage you've got. If you put Jesus in it, it's going to be a better marriage. I don't care what kind of parents you are. You put Jesus in the middle of it, you'll be better parents. I don't care what kind of uh, child you are. You'll be a better child. Son or a daughter. If you had Jesus in it. I don't care what kind of job you got. I've heard people talking about how bad a job they got. You're to have mine sometime. No, I'm. Not. I don't care what kind of job you got. You put Jesus in it, involve Jesus, it's going to get better. You've not experienced the best that life can offer in any fashion this world can throw at you until you put Jesus in it. Make Him part of it. Make him part of it. I don't care if you're just cutting the grass. If you're doing it with Jesus, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to enjoy it. It's cleaning the house, mopping the floors. If you're doing it with Jesus, you can do it with a song in your heart, smile on your face. Jesus. But guess what? He's not just going to join in. He's waiting for you to invite him in. He's waiting. He's waiting. Oh, so many people were waiting for Gideon. You know, guess what Gideon did? I'm I'm thinking run out of time. He says, I just don't know about this. He says, you're going to have to give me a sign. You're going to have to give me a sign. So he goes out and he he, he makes up this cake and all these kind of things and he brings it to the uh, angel there under the tree. There he put his staff in, in the end of it and he said it consumed it. Consumed it. This was his sign. That this angel had power. He had power. That was his sign. Oh, now he's ready to go. Because he believes in God. God's just waiting for us. To... But a lot of times we, we keep throwing out for signs. We co- uh, putting out hints. But he's still waiting on us. He's waiting for us to go. Step out on faith. We come to the invitation time. I'd like to ask very quickly. Who's waiting on who today? Are you waiting on God to make a difference in your life? Guess what? He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. Waiting on you. To say, Lord, I, here I come. Maybe seven years. Is it going to take seven years? If you'd come to your senses that God is just waiting to do something. Here he sits on a tree. He may be standing in an altar. He may be right here with you. Waiting for you. Waiting for you. Who is waiting on who today? Let us pray.